great to see each and every one of you here this morning, and those of you who are joining us online, welcome. We're glad that you've tuned in with us. As we, as Pastor Lou has already mentioned, we've been in this series um, all around reassembling of our relationships. You know, maybe you've gone, through, we've all gone through this holiday season, and we've been with family and friends, and maybe, just maybe, you were in a conversation and, and possibly you got kind of sideways with each other, or maybe you found yourself in an experience where you were at odds with another person in the past few weeks or month or so. And so we just felt like kicking off, moving into this new year, it's always good to reassemble. Reassemble and do some reassembly work in our relationships. Because relationships are key to a healthy, purposeful life. You know, relationships are messy, aren't they? None of us have perfected this area in our lives. Because we're all broken messes, really. I mean, to a varying degree. We all have our issues. Let's just be honest and upfront about that this morning. But be, deep down in each one of us, God has created this longing, this urge to have healthy relationships, loving relationships, lasting relationships. We long for that with our spouses, with our kids, our grandkids, our extended family, friends, co-workers, neighbors, and here at the church, certainly. Relational work, though, is hard. It's not intuitive. None of us was born, was born as a relational expert. We all make our share of mistakes and healthy relationships. They require humility. Humility. Authenticity. Courage. Honesty. As most of you know, I, I grew up in a family, a large family. I'm one of ten children from western Michigan and from the Holland Grand Haven area. And if you know of anything about western Michigan, you know it's kind of like the Dutch enclave. For whatever reason, a lot of the Dutch immigrants who came to this country many, many years ago, and they ended up initially in New York, and then they moved to the Midwest, to Michigan. A lot of them did. And so that's my background in you know, it's been said that Dutch people sometimes struggle with showing any emotion. I think you could say that about a lot of Northern Europeans, or we probably heard that. Certainly the British have that stiff upper lip, and the Dutch can be a little standoffish. Growing up, when there was conflict in my house, it would go something like this. There'd be total silence. You wouldn't know that there's really an issue. And then all of a sudden, this major explosion. And then there'd be silence again. And it was kind of like the approach was, we weren't ever given that opportunity to process those feelings. Maybe those, um, those places of anger. We were expected to just kind of bottle it all up and keep it inside. Suck it up. And get over it, kind of was the phrase at home. Now, Dion was raised in a totally different type of family. In fact, I was raised in a very traditional family. Dion was raised in a blended family, a non-traditional northeastern family. And, and um, we couldn't have had more of an opposite upbringing. When there was conflict in Dion's home and in her family, everything would be shared. They'd let it all hang out. You know, they would, um, they would yell and scream at each other and feelings were expressed and they were honest about where they were. They didn't shut down the discussion. They let it. In fact, it would ramp up many times. So after being together now for 33 years and both bringing our various experiences and family history into our own marriage relationship, 
you can imagine that there have been times when relationally we we've gone through these times of uh, like you know what uh, Craig you just Dion has told me Craig you just need to stop doing this or that an example of this is and we just spoke about this recently when we whenever we've come back from say we've been gone somewhere and um uh, we'll get back home and and I'm unpacking I'm always about unpacking my stuff first and and I make sure that my stuff is all put away because I'll say things like well I better make sure that that I keep track of my stuff because growing up in a family of 10 if you didn't somebody else would snag it and so it would disappear and so Dion's like uh, recently I I did this and I kind of just do it I don't even think about it it's just who I am you know it's it's the way God created me to be <laughs> yeah, so get over it no but anyhow the um yeah that's not the right response and so I've discovered that but um so she said what's the deal you know you've unpacked all your stuff and there's my you know it would have been nice you know you could have unpacked some of my stuff and I said well honestly I didn't really it wasn't intentional but I'm sorry you know I gave that kind of blanket sorry that we've all probably done and so now it's time just to get over it I don't really want to talk about it maybe you can relate to those kind of situations where and those things that seemingly are very minor can create dysfunction and and just a a growing rift in a relationship if we're not honest about them as we've been in this series you've heard us say that it's the goal isn't reconciliation but the goal is to live a life of no regret when when we stated that the first week I think I I struggled with that if I'm honest I've always been taught we need to just quickly move towards reconciliation but when you approach the scenario or when you approach a situation like that where that's your ultimate goal then then the what you're doing is you're you're entering into the conversation with already an agenda you're trying to control the outcome and so the better goal is to live a life of no regret because I can't control how someone else will react I can only control how I how I react and how I move forward we've been hearing this word from Paul throughout the course of this this uh, series that we've been in and it's from Romans 12 18 and I'd like you to join me in saying this all together let's say this this uh, scripture passage together if possible to the best of your ability live at peace with all people he doesn't say hey you know what give it a try and if it doesn't work out just give up but he says continue to to um, doing your best to the best of your ability live at peace with all people Paul is reminded it, us that we don't hold all the cards and we don't get to control the other person's response reassembly begins with us regardless regardless of who initiated the fuss doing so though requires four decisions four decisions on our part so far we've talked about over the last couple weeks um, two different two of those decisions the first one was I'll get back to you not back at you remember that when we talked about that very important 
I'll get back to you, not back at you. Second week, we talked about, I'll own my own stuff. I know that we, we all have a role to play. It's not like, you know, it takes two to tango. And so, um, you always, you're a part of it. None of us is completely innocent. And today's reassembly decisions are two more. The first one is, I'll make the first move regardless of who moved away first. The reason why um, this is so important is because the most mature person should make the first move and take responsibility for the relationship. And also, there's another, there's another reason why this is so key to a healthy relationship, ha- having healthy relationships, is, is Jesus' most inconvenient command underscores this point. He underscores this point. Let me take you there as an example from Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Now, of course, this is Jesus is, is giving his best sermon that he's ever given. In fact, the best sermon ever given by anyone is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And he's going through all these various practical steps and they all are centered around relationships and when he gets to this point he says he says therefore if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother or your sister has something against you leave your gift at the altar and go first make things right with your brother or sister and then come back and offer your gift. What Je- what's Jesus talking about here? He's talking about an inconvenient, an inconvenient long trek that people would take to the temple in Jerusalem to get in line to offer a gift at the altar. They had to take time off work. They had to drag the kids all the way through the city. They had to, there was no fast pass. There was no cutting in line. You can't call ahead. You had to stand in line. And this gift that Jesus is talking about here is is from someone grateful for when God answered a prayer. It's voluntary sacrifice expressing devotion and gratitude to God. It's kind of why we gather each and every week. Because we take all of our very real stuff out of um, our daily lives. And we, we give it to God in worship. And we, we're grateful for waking us up this morning and giving us the opportunity to be on mission with Jesus in this community. Making a real difference, offering people hope. And new life. And then Jesus says this. After they get up there and they're they're placing their gifts on the altar. And they're praising God and thanking God for all of his goodness. He says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If you get to the altar and you remember that your brother or your sister has something against you. Leave your gift and go. He says, turn around and go. Get out of line and leave. Notice how Jesus doesn't say, it depends on who's at fault. The point is, things aren't good. Or there's an unresolved conflict. A person may think it's not a big deal. I'll maybe deal with it later. Have you ever been there? I've definitely been there before. But I'm going to draw near to God first. And I'll take care of that, whatever that is, later. But compartmentalized 
vertical religion says draw near to God, horizontal Jesus says no, first go, first go and make things right. Make that relationship right before you draw near to me. You see, they are, they're interconnected, aren't they? So oftentimes, I grew up in a church where it was just, it was taught to us. I don't think it was intentional, but it, what I heard is it's just me and Jesus. And it doesn't really matter kind of um, what I did to my brother and sister, literally, on the side. As long as I gave this blanket statement, God forgive me, and I just move on forward. But you know what? They're all interconnected. In fact, Scripture reminds us that how can you say that you love God, yet hate your brother or sister, be at odds with your brother or sister? They're interconnected. Our relationship with God is a direct outflow of our relationship with others. Jesus says we can't just forgive them in our heads and move on. You've got to take some tangible action. Instead, Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you need to go to the person you're having conflict with. Internalized religion lets us off the hook. Jesus never bought into that form of religion. Jesus invites us into a way of living out of the essence of our faith. And forgiveness is that first step towards reconciliation. Making things right. You see, every time you and I pray, you and I pray for yourself, maybe for your kids, for your friends, for direction and for help. You celebrate and leverage, leverage I celebrate and leverage the fact that God didn't stop at forgiveness. He reconciled you to you in order to have a relationship with you. It all ties back into relationship. You see, I'll make the first mute move regardless of who moved away first. That is a an essential reassembly tool in having good relationships. Stop blaming and start claiming God's healing grace and put that in action. Decision number four, I'll keep the door open and the welcome mat out. I'll keep the door open and the welcome mat out. I'm not talking about reconciling with people who are who are unsafe or either physically or emotionally. And, and um, I'm, that's not what we're talking about here. But beyond that, for some relationships, moving towards someone you're at odds with is a daily, is a daily thing, right? Stuff keeps happening and Maybe you're tempted to just kind of give up on that relationship, tempted to cross your arms and say, I tried, I don't care anymore. That's when we need to remember that do we want that ultimate goal to reach that ultimate goal of reconciliation, but prior to getting to that goal, living a life of no regrets? When our core relationships break, something inside each one of us breaks, you see? When we don't know what to do, we usually do the wrong thing and possibly make things worse. But now you know. So I wonder, as we've been through this series, as we've talked about all these relationship-oriented interactions I wonder what we're going to do about it are they just teachings from scripture that kind of really um, we hear and but but we're not really putting them into action 
how are we going to live lives with no regrets by repairing broken relationships? How are we going to put these reassembly tools in our toolbox, these steps? How are we going to, um, I'll get back to, back to and not back at. How are we going to apply that in our own lives? How are we going to apply, I'll own my own stuff and not blame others? How are we going to apply, I will make the first move regardless of who moved away first? And lastly, how are we going to apply, I will keep the door open and the welcome mat out. When everything in me wants to close the door, I'm going to remember what my Heavenly Father through Christ did for me. He doesn't count my sins, your sins, against you. He moves towards us. He moves towards us, and when it comes down to it, many times, many times, don't miss this, many times, a broken relationship is the catalyst for a broken faith. A broken relationship is the catalyst for a broken faith. So as much as I hope that we'll all be reconciled to a sister or a brother that we're at odds with, a parent or a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, child as much as i hope that we get that it all begins to really make that a reality in our lives the first step is being reconciled to god because we need i need the power of the holy spirit to live out these principles that we've been talking about and so do you and so what i simply mean to say this morning is have you been reconciled to your heavenly father have you taken that first step have you had that heartwarming experience where you said yes to jesus you've been invited him into your life you see the christian journey is all about relationship it's a, it's about a personal relationship with god in and through Jesus. That was the purpose of why Jesus was sent. That's the beginning of our journey. If we miss that, the rest of it is just going to seem so cumbersome, so, so much driven by just what we do and what we don't do. And it's going to become frustrating and it's going to lead to a broken faith. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.20. He says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God, who removed all the obstacles and went looking for each and every one of us. Not to get back at you, but to get back to you. Because in spite of you, he loves you, period. He loves you, period. Now, many of you know that, that we are in a challenging season. We've been in a challenging season the last few, few years. And specifically, we're in a challenging season where we really need to reassemble and we really need to hone in on some of these principles that we've been talking about. And what I'm talking about is the challenging season that we're in in the United Methodist Church. As we go through this split that we're currently in, and as more and more of our brothers and sisters are disaffiliating and churches are leaving the denomination and joining a new expression of Methodism 
how do we maneuver through all of that as a congregation without becoming bitter or maybe becoming at odds with each other because we are a divided congregation here and people feel strongly on this particular question that we're wrestling with and so how do we take these principles and make them be a part of our story as we move forward in this process and I just wanted to be really clear because I'm hearing, as I'm sure many of you have been hearing, if you're plugged in here at First Church, um, over the past few weeks we've been talking about this, we've been praying about this, the leadership team has been certainly praying through this and, and walking through these steps on God, what is the best way to lead here at First Church? So that we can continue to be a vital ministry in, in our community. And certainly, we want to be honorable. We want to have integrity in this process and follow this, the process that the denomination has set up. And so, if you are a member here at First Church, you'll be receiving you'll be receiving this next week a, a letter that will indicate the process. The leadership team has been, as I said, has been meeting and has recently sent to the district superintendent um, a notification to begin to have an informational meeting. And at this informational meeting, quite simply, it is just that. And um, various things will be discussed, and that is open to the, to the membership of the congregation. And so I can't underscore how important that gathering will be. Following that gathering, we're going to have to make another decision. We're going to have to make another decision whether or not we want to continue to, to move forward in what is known as disaffiliation process, or, or do we, we've got enough information, we just want to kind of see other decision that we need to make. No voting has taken place. Hear me. No voting has taken place at that point in time. Then, and it's very important that we follow this process, we have to follow this process, then, the, um, and prior to, say, if we decide, uh, if we discern as a congregation that we want to move forward towards voting on this, officially voting, that is a vote of membership, and, um, and that would come later, a little bit later. But prior to that... I've really, and many of our leaders, we've really sensed the important thing here is, first and foremost, to be praying about this, because this is an important, important issue. Secondly, to test the body prior to an official vote. And so you've heard me mention before of having a straw poll. And so we would, and this is all going to be clearly stated in this letter. With dates, we're waiting to hear. Of course, that's all coordinated through the district offices and um, the date. But we're going to plan in a straw poll, and that's something separate that we can plan ourselves. And just to, to test the body and see where we are. Because we want to do moving forward what is most healthy and best for this church. Whenever you vote, there's always winners and losers. And I don't know how you get away from that, honestly, just being honest and real. But my hope and prayer is, is that as we work through this, that Regardless of how, where you are, 
that you would um, be willing to just um, live in right relationship with each other, regardless of the person next to you sees it differently. And may we be able to move forward together and be drawn together. My hope and prayer is when we're done with this, would we be more healthy as a congregation in our relationships with each other because we've been able to maneuver through this difficult conversation. So I lift that up to you um, and just love to hear your feedback as we continue to move forward. The leadership team would love to hear your feedback and we um, certainly keep this all in your prayers. Would you pray with me this morning? Gracious and loving God, would you Speak to us now as you already have in so many ways throughout the worship experience as we listen to how your healing touch has been prevalent through this body upon the Jones family and and the um, various lives that this ministry is continuing to, um, to bless and to reach. And as we come to this table of communion, this table where we offer up our, our thankfulness, our gratefulness, God, if we come today being at odds with each other, God, you, you say the same words that you shared in the Sermon on the Mount. Leave your gift at the altar and go. Go and make things right. May your spirit right now move in our hearts and convict us, convert us more and more to, to the love of Jesus. For this community that you've placed us in, for the relationships that are close to us, God, may we commit to making those relationships right so that we can live lives of no regret. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.